morning, we're going to be in um, Genesis chapter 44, right? Genesis chapter 44, and uh, we're going to be reading, okay, um, from, actually from, uh, let me see, from verse 16, and we're going to be reading down, um, okay, and we're going to be dealing with our message, uh, will we stand together in a crisis? All right, and there's a very good question uh, that, uh, to address and to ask. All right, as we're dealing with right, part 16, even in our message and our series on the life of Joseph. Okay, and we'll start with verse 16 and we'll read down. Okay, just for context, uh, just connect from uh, our last message. In verse uh, 16, And Judah said, What shall we say unto our Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are thy Lord's servants, but we and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. But the man in whom in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. And Ju then Judah came near to, unto him and said, O my Lord, let my servant, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my, my Lord, We have a father, an old man, a child of his old age, and a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou, and thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto thy Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, uh, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. Thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. If ye, if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he should, will die, and thy servants will bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, I pray thee, let my, thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my lord. Let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me? Let's put adventure, I see the evil that shall come on my father. And, and may God bless to us the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, even for this morning, Lord, for um, even this time in the Word. And Lord, uh, I just pray and ask that you bless not only the reading of your Word, but uh, Lord, uh, the teaching and preaching also. Lord, I pray that you use me even as thy, as thy instrument, fill me with thy spirit, Lord, that uh, I may preach uh, with all power, with all utterance. And this morning, even uh, as we um, even celebrate Father's Day and uh, we think of fathers, Lord, I pray that uh, this message will also be of a help, encouragement to all fathers. And Lord, also will remind us, even most of all, of our Heavenly Father. And uh, Lord, for your love and your compassion towards us. And uh, Lord, I pray and ask uh, you help us to consider this morning even the importance of family and of standing together as one. And we just commit this time to you, Lord. Use me as thy instrument. And we ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Okay. And we'll start this morning with this uh, message, all right? Uh, will we stand together in a crisis? Now, we saw in the last message, right? And this was uh, two Sundays ago, okay? Um, that what happened was this, uh, it ended up with the brothers facing a very hard predicament, right? When Benjamin was implicated for theft, okay? And so now we come to the moment of truth, right? Because uh, what will the brothers do, right? And they're going to stand together as family and they're going to, uh, stand with Benjamin or will they throw him under the bus? Now you see, it's easy for everyone 
right uh to come together whether at home or elsewhere right to laugh and drink together eat and drink when there's no trouble where everything is going fine but what happens when things are not going well right uh it, it's not so easy suddenly to be nice to one another right uh when we have to pay a price for that okay or when we have to suffer affliction together right even more so when every man in this situation now is going to be asking themselves the question are we all going to suffer together because of what benjamin did Okay, now, the circumstantial evidence is speaking very, very loudly. Okay, but the problem is this, right? Circumstantial evidence doesn't always explain what's really going on. Okay, not without a, a full investigation, whatever, you don't really know. But it will seem to point, right, a smoking gun at Benjamin that he stole the this special cup that belongs to Joseph, right? And, um... It, again, the commentators have mentioned that how this is a divining cup and uh, is considered very important, uh, of, is of significance to the Egyptians. And so someone who actually steals that, right, is worthy of death. Now, how many of the brothers are going to, you know, those who have grew, grown up with him are, are inclined to stand with him right now? Because this is going to say something about how well they actually know him and about the relationship that they have. Okay, and the sad part and the sad reality is this many times the reality of a relationship will be exposed, right? And will be revealed in a time of trouble. Now, um, how also will we face adversity? Right? Will we go and face that with the strength of the Lord or with our own strength and fail in the process? Now, Proverbs 24, verse 10 tells us, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Right? It's gonna reveal uh, okay, the true nature, the true status. And and we've seen we're seeing this right in the last two and a half years or so through the uh COVID pandemic right nations societies marriages families and even churches are not spared okay because um the crisis and the danger reveals the true essence the true character of each of these relationships and whether they can actually stand up to a time of testing and especially a time of trouble now there's some questions that we, we need to ponder this morning will be this how do we lead right as, as in particular as men and as fathers in a time of trouble in a time of crisis then the other question to ponder is this how do we treat one another right how do we behave when there is a crisis and as i mentioned the title of this message today right will we stand together okay especially as a family right or as a marriage or as a church family in a time of crisis now we begin with our first part of the message, right? Uh, we're beginning with verse 12, right? And we see the heap of evidence against Benjamin. Now, a search was made and, uh, and Joseph's cup was found, right, in Benjamin's sack. Now, look at verse 12. And he searched and began at the elders and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, right? Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his ass and returned to the city. Now, up to this point, as I mentioned, right, the Evidence that was found uh, that was inside Joseph's, uh, in, in Benjamin's sack, right, was circumstantial. Okay, there could be a number of possible explanations. Uh, just like how the, the money was actually found, right, inside their sacks and they, they had not stolen it, right, it was actually given back to them. Now, um, there could be a number of reasons, but the question would be this, right, how would they respond to this? How would they react towards one another? And we come to the moment of truth because what would they do? Right? Because at this point, they, they can choose to disavow any association with Benjamin, right? refuse to return to the city, or they could stand together. What will it be? Right? Or maybe there could, will be a division among the brothers. Right? Some say, no, no, we, we, we should stand with Benjamin. Uh, you know, um, let's see what happens. Right? Uh, let's, you know, we we'll speak on his behalf. You know, it cannot, it, you know, some could, could it be that some of the brothers could say, no, look, we know Benjamin in all our lives. Right? He's not like that. That's not how he is. And yet, what we're going to see here is uh, many times, right, those that claim to know us or know someone right, very, very well or are supposedly close to us are among the first to assume the worst right, when there is something that they cannot kind of piece together uh, they, or they cannot make sense of a, a certain situation. They, we, we're quick to assume the worst of each other. Uh, we're quick to assume, you know, that, oh, it must be that, you know, uh, you must have done this thing and done this wrong, whatever, uh, in the face of false accusations. Now, will the brothers stand together, uh, you know, 
you know, or will they throw each other under the bus? Now, the question, oh, some of us may ask, right, why would they do that? Aren't they from the same family? But, well, it's true, they're from the same family, but understand this. Um, this was the same family that tried to, uh, that abused, attempted to murder Joseph, right, before selling him off as a slave. Uh, but, but, you know, families are not exempt from all this stuff. All, right, all this drama, uh, all these problems, okay? There is no family that is exempt from problems. You go back as f you can go as far back towards Adam, right, to a, a, a group of people who are as close to perfection, right, uh, uh, as Adam and his wife and his family. And guess what? Cain, the first siblings, Cain killed his own brother, Abel. And, you know, people will do this to one another. Years, years back, right? And many years back, twice in a row, I've seen people in two different churches attempt to distance themselves from a problem, offering to throw somebody else, right? To sacrifice someone, throw them under the bus instead in order to escape personal liability, right? Because they were operating on the uh, rule every man for himself. Okay, and what's going to happen next in this chapter will reveal the nature, the character of this family, right? And so we see the next part here, um, when Judas speaks in verse 16, where they hitch their fates together. Right? It says, And Judas said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are thy Lord's servant, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Now, I want to kind of note something here, right? Judah is speaking on behalf of the group, right? Of, the, of all the brothers. And... What is interesting is that Reuben, Simeon, and Levi are conspicuously silent. Now, Judah is not the oldest. Reuben is, right? Then followed by Le Simeon and Levi, but all of them were silent. Instead, it was Judah that took the lead to speak to Joseph concerning to the matter and to make decisions. Now, again, in a time of crisis and, 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 um, and problem or trouble, people, some people can be paralyzed right, by indecision. Right, by fear and then not uh or maybe sometimes they hope that you no know, if they do nothing right nothing will happen to them okay and they're not willing to stick their necks out for one another now notice judah's uh speech right and what he says and with respect to that right his decision now he says we are thy lord servant both we and he also with whom the cup is found now notice his decision right one for all and all for one and, but he considered this, that he conceded that they were all guilty, right, at that moment. And so they stood guilty before Joseph and they were willing to take up responsibility. Now, this is, this signals also a change in the, the brothers. Now, in the past, um, again, we, we don't know the details, right, um, as to what happened or the kind of uh, evil report that uh, Joseph had brought to their father concerning the brothers. But, um, you know, it, you can infer that there were things that they would, did not always discharge their responsibility well. They uh, were not responsible for whatever that uh, their father had actually given to them. And he, yet, yet now, Judah actually takes the step forward, right? As a leader. All right, and, and this morning, as we even consider Father's Day, now, you know, as a father, you, you have a role of leadership to take up. Okay? It's no longer just about the decisions that we make are no longer just about ourselves, but about those who are dependent on us, right? Uh, uh, and together with our, our wives, okay? They're dependent on us. Now, there are consequences when we make wrong decisions. Now, and here, Judah is willing to accept responsibility, right? And to accept the consequences of what they've done. Now, we see here he argues that, okay, they, they stand silent, right? Unable to argue their innocence before Joseph. And likewise, you know, the law of God uh, renders us speechless, right? When we, if and when we should stand before God. Now, notice Romans chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. It says, now we know that whatsoever, uh, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now, what was the purpose? This is that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Right? The law of God establishes the guilt of every single living human being. Right? That we are guilty and not that it, it stops the argument. Right? Uh, that we can argue or justify ourselves. 
and we stand guilty before God. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? And God, so we have to realize God's laws were not given to us so that we can learn to be moral or righteous and, and good. Okay? That's a lie. In fact, it is a doctrinal error. Okay? They were given for a very specific purpose, which was to prove to all mankind that we can never be perfectly, absolutely righteous. Only God can do that. And because of that, we have a need for the righteousness of God. Because if we were to be judged by God's laws, right, according to his standards, we are going to fall far short for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, even if we were to keep a single, all right, keep God's laws in overall, breaking a single one will render us guilty of breaking the whole law. Now, James 2 verse 10 tells us, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay? You just have to break one. Right? I just have to ask a very simple question. Right? Have you ever lied? And the fact is this, right? That because we've... Uh, none of us can... And by the way, anyone who says, I've, I, I've never lied, you know, is a liar. Okay? And breaking one. And, and how many lies do we have to uh, tell to be a liar? One. Only one. And here it says we were already guilty of breaking all of God's laws because where God is concerned, his standard of righteousness is this it is an all or nothing situation. Now Judah decides that they will hitch their fate together as family and as brothers. Okay? And um, they will stand together. Now he declared all of them will become Joseph's servants, not just Benjamin. And we see in the scriptures, right, that Jesus taught his disciples we have to love one another with a sacrificial love, laying down our lives as brethren for one another. Now look at John 15 verse 12 and 13. This is my commandment, right? From the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye love one another. Okay, all oh, sounds easy. No, to what extent? It says, as I have loved you. Which means what? To what extent? All the way to death, to laying down his life for others. He follows it in, in verse 13. Greater love had no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Okay? We're to love one another, all right? Uh, those who are in Christ, right? Uh, fellow disciples with the same patience, compassion, mercy, and to love them even unto death, the way Christ did for us. Okay? John, in his epistle, emphasized some, uh, the same thing, right? First John Okay, uh, chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? Here it says, here's how we know, right? Here's how we know the, 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 uh, the love of God, right? Christ laid down his life for us at Calvary that we might be saved. And... It follows from there, right? As disciples, as, as those who are redeemed and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that we ought to also lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? We ought to do the same. All right? How is it demonstrated? Not by word, but by action. Look at verse 16. All right? But whoso had this world's good and see if his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how do I love the love of God in him? Okay, remember verse 16 talks about hereby perceive we the love of God, right? Here's how we know the love of God. Christ laid down his life for us, right? And because of that, we ought to lay down our life for our brethren. Now it says here, this comes from our love for the brethren. Because here it says, okay, if you see your brother, you, uh, you have been blessed. And you see your brother have a need and you shut up, right, your compassion. Okay, we're talking about the bowels of compassion. Okay, think about the just... All the from the inside, right? Our compassion from him. This is how do I love the love of God in him? Okay, now this. How can you say that we have the love of God in us? We cannot love our brother in that sense, in that same way. Right? There is need, and, it, and you will notice something: the love of God, right, as expressed towards one another, is not just in platitudes. Not just in saying nice things and exchanging nice greetings. Oh, hi, brother so-and-so. Oh, hi, sister so-and-so. You know, oh, God bless you. Oh, I hope you, you know, have a nice Sunday. It goes beyond that. 
right? And it's seen in action. That's why we'll see the word love in particular, right? Uh, in the new, for, among New Testament believers, right? Uh, is, is expressed in the word charity. Okay? It's a love that goes to action. It says, how do I love the love of God in him? Okay, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay, in other words, love is not going to be seen in terms of merely expressing the words, saying it, or by professing it. Okay, neither love not, okay, not love in word, neither in tongue. Okay, just because you keep saying it doesn't mean that you love someone. Then how is it done? This is, but in deed and in truth. Two things here. All right. In terms of what we do, all right, how we treat one another, and then by our mutual love and obedience to the truth of God's word. Okay. Now this is contrary, all right, opposite to the uh, fake Christianity, modern Christianity's worldview. Because here we see love is never separated nor divorced from truth. Yet today, many people will claim that, oh, um, you, know, you're, you're, uh, you know, you love the truth, but you know, you're not loving. Hey, you, the two go together. All right? And there is no such thing as a hierarchy where you say, well, uh, love comes first over and above the truth. If that, that is the case, that's spiritual adultery. Okay? That's a man-made love. Because here we're going to see, we love indeed. Right? What we do for one another. What we... Uh, how we treat one another, how we spend time with one another, and then in terms of truth, right? In terms of um, our love for the truth that God gives to us. So, we're talking here about okay, Judah and the brothers, right? Now tying what's going to happen to them, right, uh, to Benjamin. Okay, standing together. And, you know, a good father, right? We, we, today happens to be his Father's Day. A good father will teach his children to stand together in unity and in strength rather than to be divided. Now look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, right? Verse 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they, f uh, if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he followed, for he had not another to help him up. Okay? And there is companionship, right? There is, uh, this alleviates the loneliness. There is, um, okay, working and laboring together. There is a rejoicing together, right? There is a sharing of the rewards together. And here, okay, this can be, of course, with, uh, can, can speak of uh, any relationship, okay? Uh, friends, right, brothers, uh, family, all that. But and so we see here, okay, the, the blessing of that companionship. But if you move on, you're gonna see verse eleven again. If two lie together, then they have heat, right? But how can one be warm alone? Now, I believe this would be in the context of marriage, okay? Um, you know, together. Right, the comfort uh, together, even in marriage, uh, and even in sharing of the marital bit, and then he says, "And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken." All right, we see verse twelve here so important that standing together as family, standing together in a marriage, is important. All right, and we stand even against dangers, against uh, threats. And notice, a threefold cord is not quickly broken up. What happens if we, we see here, uh, you, you know, you can have, uh, if you just have string or, or twine, now, string can be easily, you know, you can just uh, very quickly and easily pull that apart and break it. But what happens when you twist and twine it, and the more intertwined it becomes, right, and you keep turning and twisting it, and then from there, uh, you use that and then to further intertwine uh, with other, okay, smaller ropes, what happens? Uh, you could have a, Okay, you can have a cord, you can form that into a rope, and then you're going to find it becomes very, very strong. Right? A threefold cord. 
instead of just one or two, okay, but three, but the, the, notice this, that twisting and twining uh, together, all right, that actually strengthens it. And now, how does that happen in real life? Well, the thing is, is the more involved we are with each other, right, the more we interact with one another, the more we have to do with each other's lives. Not that, that this intertwining now, instead of two parallel lives, not weapons, we, we become very intertwined with one another, all right? Whether it's in, in, in marriage, okay, whether um, as a family, now whether as a church, okay, this ought to happen. This intertwining, and then uh, as we interlock, right, it becomes stronger. And yet today, our, one of the characteristics right, of our modern day, our, our modern day uh, life is this. We live parallel lives even under the same roof. Right? Separate schedules, right? separate vacation times. Uh, you know, it's made worse by uh, the fact that even uh, very often, right, school, uh, polytechnic, university, all have different uh, calendars. And what we did even as a nation in in uh, going with that model of following right uh, uh, a Western model served to actually split and divide the family such that everyone's got different vacation time when someone's free the other one's busy when someone's busy then the other one's free and you know uh we're losing that connection in the process now these were lessons that Jacob should have taught his wives and his children instead of allowing them to strive. Uh, uh, for control and mastery, you know, and, uh, uh, for dominance over one another, right? Uh, he should have taught them to stand together instead of standing against one another. Now, but here, what we can see is through the series of events, God has been setting a set of circumstances for the brothers to learn this the hard way, right? And learn they will, okay? You, because you see here, Judah makes a conscious decision that they are going to tie their fates, their lives together, uh, and the outcome of what's going to happen in this situation uh, is going to be tied very closely together where it is very natural for most people to try to distance themselves. Now, and so he calls for a huddle with Joseph. Now look at the next verse, right from verse 18 onwards. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, say, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. And so he requested for a private audience with Joseph, okay, and um, appealed to his authority, right? Because Joseph is, the, is holding the second highest office in the land, and he is acting as a representative of Pharaoh. Okay, by speaking privately, he hoped probably that there could be more leeway for Joseph to act favorably, right? And he sought to smooth things over to appease his anger over this matter. Um, okay, which is interesting because uh, we see a very different side to the brothers, right? Because they were known for uh, venting their anger and hatred before, all right? And um, whenever there was a problem, okay? But we see a very different side. We see a side right now that's um, willing to negotiate, right? Willing to speak, to talk softly, right? To come to an agreeable uh, arrangement, okay? Which is something that they should have done even in dealing with Joseph, right? Uh, if any problem they had with their father, with Joseph, you know, to deal with that that way rather than to uh, vent it in terms of violence and, and anger and hatred. Now, we see the Bible tells us a soft or a gentle answer, right, will diffuse anger. Proverbs 15 verse 1, it says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, when at the moment when something happens, you and I have a choice. All right, how will we respond? Uh, what will we say? Okay, because a soft answer okay, will diffuse the situation. Whereas um, you're not, you didn't like what somebody said, right? You, you said something else and you, you and I could escalate the thing. I right? could stir up anger. We could make things worse than they were. It's, uh, we can pour fuel over a fire. Now Proverbs 16 verse uh, 14 to 15 tells us, you know, uh, in particular, when we deal with someone who is in authority, it says the wrath of a king is as messengers of death. Okay? You say the wrong thing and, you know, it could mean the end of your life. Okay? It says, but a wise man will pacify it. Rather than to, okay, 
uh, escalate rather than to stir things up to make things worse. Since a wise man will pacify the anger. Since in the light of the king's countenance is life. Okay? The king has the authority over life or death. Is this, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. And where, where there is favor weapons, it can bring life. Okay? Uh, the latter rain, okay, again, there is an early and latter rain uh, which affects the when we plant, we, we sow, uh, and then, uh, you know, and then before the harvest, okay, the, the, the rains have to come in the right time. Now, it, it gives life, or it could, if the rains don't come, it could mean the end of the harvest, right? Here is his, it's, his favor, is as a cloud of the lesser rain, right? It brings life, it's just his countenance is life, okay? And so, Joseph now uh, speaks, okay, now, sorry, Judah now speaks with Joseph, and he recounts, right, Joseph's questions and inquiries concerning their family. Now, verse 19 says, My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead. Right? He alone is left of his mother, and his father love of him. Now, so Judah states what they believe, and what they and the brothers, and, and also Jacob believe, right? That uh, Joseph is already dead, Benjamin is alone and he's the only surviving child of his mother. Okay, but this is all now very specific information for Joseph. He's hearing this for the first time. Confirmation about uh, whether his father is alive, right? Whether, uh, you know, how, how Benjamin, uh, the relationship within the family. Okay, and um, Judah and the brothers have been consistent about what they've been saying. But uh, he reveals all right, that while Benjamin is alone, right, he's dearly beloved of his father Jacob. Okay? Now, this is, this is, now this is Joseph's baby brother, right, whom he loves and he cares for. And, and here we see all right, the, re the statement of those facts. Right? He says, you notice this part very clearly, and his father love of him. A father's love. You know, as I deal with people, in particular with young adults, one of the things that uh, has stands out, especially in the last few years, right? More so than uh, in, in the last 20 years. The last few years is this. That many are seeking the love of their father. And it's missing in their lives. Okay? They're seeking it. They can't find it. They're trying to find substitutes for that. Okay? Some, uh, I had to tell someone, you know, you're, you're confusing, you know, the, the, the love for your father, right? Which is missing. And this person it turns it into a sexual love for other men instead. Right? Looking, I said, and you I, I told this person, you're looking for it in the wrong places. Okay? It's not going to be settled this way. Many of uh, these have issues, right? Uh, where fathers have turned themselves, right, into just becoming economic creatures, right? We, we just, or economic entities, all we do is uh, what, uh, work, earn money, pay the bills, right? Um, but forgetting that, you know, the, the other needs within the home and the family do not go away. Now, this was, by the way, this was the very thing that was causing a problem in Joseph's family, right? The, all the brothers wanted Jacob's love, right? They wanted their father to love them, to appreciate them, to love them for who they are. But what happened? Um, instead, Joseph, uh, right? Jacob loved ben, uh, Joseph above all the others, right? Which caused resentment, which caused uh, envy and, and then hatred towards Joseph. And then we see that after Joseph was gone, what happens? Jacob repeats the same pattern again in uh, loving Benjamin exclusively, right? At the expense of all the others. Okay, now, all the brothers want their father to love them. Okay, but this is the thing that's been missing. Okay, and we see Judah explains, right, that um, 
Joseph demanded for Benjamin to come to Egypt. And so that was what they, they tried to do now. Verse 21, And thou says unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. We say unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Okay? And so he, he stated they had serious reservations about bringing Jake, uh, Benjamin down because of Be Jacob's fears. All right? It was impossible for Benjamin to come to uh, Egypt because if anything should happen to him, right, Jacob will be inconsolable, right, with sorrow. And we, we establish a few facts here from what Judah has been saying. Jacob loves Benjamin very, very much. And Jacob cannot live without Benjamin by his side. And, um, and, but Jacob is very, very fearful of losing Benjamin. Okay? And that uh, if anything should happen to him, he says he, he, he will just die. He will just go to an early grave all right, because of that. Now, by the way, that statement ought to be true whether it was Benjamin, Joseph, or right, Reuben, right, uh, Simeon, Levi, Judah, so on and so forth. It ought to be true of all of the brothers, not just uh, you know, just, not just one or two particular favorites. Okay, and this is something that um, you know, Jacob has not quite understood. Okay, and realizes even in, in parallel, do you realize that God? Love, no, the scriptures makes it very clear. For God so loved who? The elect, the select few? No. The world that he gave his only begotten son. All. Not just the nice ones, not just the ones that he liked. Okay? Uh, God doesn't choose in that way. Okay? Not just the righteous. All because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All right, He died for the ungodly. He died uh, while we were yet without strength. All right, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, realize this. We hear this so many times today. It's like, oh, you know, we got to love all our children equally. Now, here's the problem they're not the same. All our children are not the same. They're not identical. They're not clones of one another. They're very, very different people. Okay, and what we should be doing is loving them for who they are and in spite of who they are sometimes, All right? And to, you know, take the trouble because sometimes we can see the problem just by, uh, you know, with this idea that, oh, why can't you be like more like your brother or why can't you be more like your sister? No, you can't because you are you and they are they. They're, you're all very different people. And, you know, every one of us needs to be loved and appreciated for who we are, for the uniqueness that we bring to the table. All right? Should there be an equal priority to the love, all right, to all? Yes. But can you love them in the same way? I don't, I don't, personally, I do not believe that that can be uh, true, simply because they are very different individuals. And that ought to be the case, that we will appreciate them for who they are. Okay? And um, remember, this was the problem that jo uh, Jacob had in his family, right? Isaac uh, loved his brother Esau because, uh, you know, Esau will hunt and cook uh, venison for him. But, you know, uh, his mother, uh, Rebecca, was different, right? She loved Jacob instead. And, you know, and, and there were problems because it is, that was a transactional love. All right, what the kids can do for you. Oh, this one, you know, it, it makes me proud. You know, it makes me look good as a parent. Why? Because this, this one's always winning medals and always winning trophies, whatever. Or oh, this one, oh, it's not good in school and whatever, can't study. Uh, you know, it's an embarrassment to me. Now, it, it should not be based on what they do, but who they are. All right? And Joseph made and gave an ultimatum to bring Benjamin. It says, uh, verse 23, And thou says unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. Okay, and so here was uh, a recount, all right, a recollection of uh, the things that transpired. Uh, with, okay, and as far as Joseph's instructions were given to the brothers. And so 
Judah kind of brought things up to speed, up to that point. Okay, but in the midst of this, the, he gives and offers information about the home, about the family, about J Jacob, right? About what he's like. And so we see, right, his attachment to Benjamin, right? His attachment to Benjamin uh, and that the loss, okay? The loss of Joseph. But then we see more than that, right? In the next few verses, because then Judah continues to ex uh, expand on this, right? So we see the heartache of Jacob. Verse 24, And it came to pass when we came up to, unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord, right? So uh, the time came uh, to uh, return to Egypt, right? Egypt because the food had run out. Okay. And verse 25 says, And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. Okay. So they protested, right? They said, we're not going to be able to go down, right? You, you can tell us to go down, but we're not going to be able to go down. It's not possible because unless we can produce Benjamin, that Joseph is not going to see us. We're not going to be able to bring back any food. Okay. And it was in the midst of this that now we hear, Joseph hears for the very first time, right? Jacob's heartache and heartbreak. Okay, look at verse 27. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, He know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. Right? There is the, the loss of Joseph. And here in, in pointing out jo Jacob's decision, Joseph starts to see that his father is still in mourning, still grieving over Joseph's death. All right, and he is terrified, fearful at the prospect of possibly losing Benjamin. All right, that he, he would rather that Benjamin does nothing with his life, right, except sit there by his side, right, because so that there is no more further setbacks or disappointments that will push him to an early death. Okay, we can get so caught up right with fear that we we cannot move forward and we see a glimpse here that jacob right is frozen in time and is unable to move forward here we see a clue right that jacob still misses joseph loves him very much right but he's in mourning he's grieving over that loss and can I put it to you, many times, those of us who hang on to that, we end up being kind of frozen in time. Unable to move forward, right? Because of what had happened. That devastating loss, right? Uh, the, the pain that, come, uh, that comes from that, and we're stuck. Right? And Joseph is seeing, you know, his father cannot move on. Right? His father is fearful. And so his father, even though Benjamin is no longer a young child, but he's afraid of letting Benjamin go. We see this further amplified in verse 29. And if ye take this also from me, right, referring to Benjamin, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Jacob loves Benjamin, right? He greatly loves him, but he's going to be totally devastated, inconsolable if he were to lose him to, uh, together with Joseph. But another interesting fact here that emerges is um, Joseph is not hearing any sign of uh, bitterness, envy, or hatred concerning all that Judah is saying uh, about okay, Benjamin or how Jacob, uh, his love, his relationship with Benjamin is concerned, right? You're not hearing this, uh, Joseph's not detecting any of this um, ill will or bad feeling or whatever concerning uh, Benjamin, okay? And all these, again, signal a, that there is a change, there is a difference compared to how things were, okay, 20 over years ago. 
Now, I want to ask this question this morning, right? Are you and I stuck in the past grieving or mourning? Isn't it time for us to let go, all right, and to hand this over to and to surrender this to God instead, to allow Him to deal with it instead of us trying to hold on, all right, to the hurt, the disappointment, right, the tears? Are we allowing God today to comfort us in our heartbreak? All right, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, right, verse 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus, uh, Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, notice the titles and the description and attributes of God. He's the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, right, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, it says here, blessed be God, right? He says he's the Father, okay? And, I, and again, I want us to think about this, right? Our Heavenly Father. Okay, it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Father of mercies. All right, all mercy. And, and notice, he is merciful. Fathers, you know, it's one thing for us to teach, train, and discipline our children, no? but are you merciful? Are you also compassionate? Because God is, right? He's balanced in all these. He's the Father of mercies and He's the God of all comfort, right? In, can we, are we the ones? Okay, so often what happens is, is the one who is doing the comforting is mom, right? Can our children come to us for comfort? It says who comforted us in all our tribulation, in the time of trouble, right? It says that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Now, the principle is very simple here, okay? We come to God. God, the Father, is He's the Father of all comfort. He's able to comfort us in any time, in any trouble, so that we can do the same for others by pointing them to God who can comfort them. Pointing them to the same source of comfort where we have been blessed. All right? Because our Heavenly Father knows what we go through. And He is able to comfort us so that we can do the same for others. Now, the Scriptures speak much, right? And we don't have time to actually go through all the, all the Psalms, for instance, and all the passages that talk about com the comfort of God and His consolation. But look at Psalm 69, verse 29 to 30. He says, But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. All right? But you see, it's not going to come from other things. You, you have to turn to God. All right? And we have to seek his face and let him be the one. And, you know, and he's the God of our salvation. And, um, it, it, you know, that even in the face of death, even in the face, okay, uh, whether we go through, we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, you know what? We are comforted by His presence with us. All right, Psalm 116, verse 3 and 4, the sorrows of death compass me. And says, I'm surrounded by the sorrows of death. Then the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. But the psalmist writes, right? It's, Everywhere, it says, everywhere I look, everywhere I turn, this is what I find. All right, the sorrows, that, okay, it's not just sorrow, it's not just a, a temporary thing. It says there is a risk even of uh, losing a life, all right? And yet here it says, Then call I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. All right, the psalm testifies of God's goodness, grace, and mercy, all right, of his deliverance of his people. Right, these words are not just nice to read stuff. All right, it's not just nice sounding platitudes. It's a spiritual reality. That's why right. what what is written in Psalm here in, in a Psalm like this, it's speaking of the track record of God. This is what God has done. All right, because of who He is. But we also have to recognize and realize not all pain will be gone on this earth. Right? And, but God one day will 
comfort us from all this. Revelation 21 verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Alright? There will come a day, it says there will be no more death, and no more death, no more grieving, no more mourning. It says neither will there be sorrow, there will be no more crying. It says there will be no more pain. Okay, the most useless product okay, out there will be painkillers. Okay, no more pain. People so, many, so often seek the bottle all right, of alcohol in order to take away their emotional pain. This is one day, this is all this is going to be passed away. But realize this, this is not, okay? Many times the problem is this. Instead of, um, we're demanding to have, you know, heaven on earth, so to speak. All right, that all pain, all discomfort, all uh, bad things uh, need to be eliminated from my life right here, right now. And that's not, not going to happen because what? What God offers to us instead is Himself. Christ offers Himself and His relationship with us as the solution. All right? and, he, and God gives to us the comfort of the Holy Spirit to comfort us. All right? it, it literally, His name, one of His titles is the Comforter. To comfort us in this life right now, regardless of whatever we go through, right? rather than to eliminate all bad things from happening. But the time will come. Okay, the time will come because when you, by the time you get to Revelation chapter 21, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, but not yet. And we need to be patient. We need to turn to the Lord, right? Trust Him. He knows what He's doing. But Jacob has been hurting and and, and um. And what hap what's happening here is this. Joseph is hearing this for the very first time. Okay? 20 over years. And his father is still grieving, weeping for his son. And you can imagine what this is, how, what's going on inside Joseph's heart, right? If only he could just send a message. If only he could just write a letter and say, Dad, I'm still here. I'm still here. Dad, I love you. I'm not gone yet. Okay? But this has been building up for a long time and, you know, Judah expresses, right, his concern concerning the harm that this is doing to Jacob, his father. Okay? Joseph is hearing also for the very first time Judah's concern for his father. Look at verse 30. Now therefore, when I come up to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us. Now he says, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. Here he acknowledges, right, that his father still loves Benjamin more than the rest of them. Okay, and he's very, very heavily vested in the life of Benjamin. But he says, okay, if Benjamin, okay, they return to uh, Canaan and Benjamin is not there with them. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. Thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. Okay? Judah is telling Joseph right now, right? He's expressing his care, his concern for his father. And, and this reveals something. It reveals something that Joseph did not previously know, right? That Judah actually, Judah and his brothers actually care about their own father. Now, in spite of the, in spite of the imperfections, in spite of the flaws of their father, they love him. It should be actually pretty obvious to us. If you go all the, all the way back to when all this started. Right, because why? The natural inclination 
of any child is this. We want to love our parent. Right? How we love our moms, how we love our fathers, are, it's different. And the problem is this. Many times with fathers, it's a very, very, it can get very, very complicated. Okay? It can be a love-hate relationship sometimes. A lot of times because of fathers and because of our uh, social and cultural conditioning, you know, there can be a lot of anger and frustration. You see, that's why, you know, the scriptures tells us, right, fathers, not to provoke our children to anger. And yet many times we fail. Right, we fail. And what I think Joseph, what Joseph is seeing is that over the years, there was a turning point that the brothers accepted the situation. They accepted the problems, the flaws, and the limitations of their own father. And listen, young people, your mom and dad are not perfect. Otherwise, they would not need to be saved by the grace of God. They would not need a savior, Jesus Christ, if that was the case, if they were perfect. All right? They have flaws. Okay? They have problems. So do you. But you notice something here. They come to a point, right, where Judah and his brothers, they love their father for who he is. The problem was this. Jacob has not understood that. To love his children for who they are. You notice he, he talks about his wife having two, two sons. Hey, what about the rest of his wives? He speaks as if there's only one wife. There's only, he has only two children. What about the rest of them? All right? His brother Roy will say, am I what, just chopped liver to you? And But time will heal all hurts and wounds. And most people, I'm not saying all, most people will change and grow over time. And what is slowly unfolding is this. Brothers are different from what they used to be. But I think there's something else that we need to uh, realize here is this. All right, that love, okay, ideally, love should be reciprocated. We give love and we will love back. We will love back in return. But, this is not always going to be the case, but it does not hinder or prevent us from loving someone fully. Also, what, what, what are you saying? I thought we were supposed, you know, we, we ought to love and then, you know, we ought to be loved back in return. Let me give you an example. What if one day mom or dad, okay, what if dad one day has dementia and he can no longer remember who you are? What then? You know the final stages, uh, my dad smiled a lot. Why? Because he was pretending that uh, he was embarrassed to admit that he may, may not remember me. And he's just trying to be friendly, very hospitable. The, the way he, 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 was, he was always, uh, even when I was growing up, he was always a friendly person, made a lot of friends. And he will smile. But to cover up the fact that he can no longer remember who we are. Does that prevent any of us from loving someone like that? No. Because love is a choice. Alright? Listen, a, f a friend, a family member, someone, a child, your, your child, could be going through a very difficult time and maybe may even very difficult to love at that point in time. It doesn't stop us I'm loving them. Why? Because love is not contingent on a feeling. It is a choice. Even in marriage, love is a unilateral choice. We exercise that on the other person, not because the other person deserves it. There are going to be days when your wife right, or your husband is going to be someone who woke up right on the wrong side of the bed, grouchy, and doesn't look like they deserve your love. Guess what? You can love them all the same. You know love can be one-sided. You know why? Every parent, father or mother, with a baby, 
you will know this. A child cannot, is not able to exercise or understand volitionally that there is a father and mother that I love. That comes later. All right. In the meantime, what do they do? They wake you up all times of the night. All right. They poop soil and dirty their diaper, whatever. They bring great inconvenience to you. And guess what? Love is there demonstrated in what we do for them because you notice something. We don't kill them just because they are inconvenient to us and they keep waking up, us up three, four times a night. I think we need to remember this. On Father's Day, every single one of us, what has our Father done for us? Just think back. I'm not asking you to think about their problems and the flaws. They, every one of them has. And, and you know something? If they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, it can be even worse. Okay, but as children, you know, we, we take a lot of these things for granted and we, we assume, or we don't think that it's a, it's a big deal. What moms and dads do for us until we become parents and then we looking back, we recognize, we understand, all right, the sacrifices that they make. We understand the love, the, the way they demonstrated that love. Yeah, I'm not embarrassed to, to, to recall this, right? That my sister and I grew up and, we, and when we were young, we would regularly, our noses, our nasal passages would be totally blocked. We have runny noses, just full of mucus and stuff, and we were unable to blow our nose or to clear it. And, you know, in the most desperate of times, my, my dad would just improvise a, a extended straw. He literally sucked that into his mouth and spat it out to get it out from us so that we could sleep. Okay. That's not something you and I would do for your, our best friend. But you see, it's easy for us to get angry and mad, just like Judah and his brothers, get mad at that for certain things. But forgetting that the things that they've done, and sometimes, many times these things are done behind the scenes. Jacob, he said, he, you know, he, he, he lost so many nights of sleep, right? Caring for the sheep, you know, the, the, the cold consumed him, the, the, the heat also... Uh, you know, uh, was devastating for him. And yet he did that what? for the sake of his family, for his children. You see, we... Many times we forget, but you see, it should not just be because of what someone did for us, but for who they are. Thirteen years back, when you know I came to discover my father had dementia and you know had brain tumors, two problems at the same time. You know, my sister and I made our peace with him. Oh, it was not in, it was not the two way thing. It was not in, interactive because he was not lucid. But we could choose on our own, one sided, right on our own that we will make our peace with him. In spite of everything, right? In spite of his failures, his flaws, and we will love him, right? And we will care for him for the rest until he is gone. Now, this one-sided love was demonstrated to us by our Heavenly Father. Romans 5 8 it says, But God commended his love toward us in that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? It, it's irrespective of, it's not something we earn. It's not something that we uh, try to work up to be in order to be good enough that Christ would die for us. No. While we were not deserving. Verse 10, it says, For 
if when we were enemies, can you imagine enemies? So we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And realize, you know, this God demonstrated that at the cross. You know, fathers will go through all sorts of things. And, many, and there will be times that fathers are angry at their own children. And we've seen how tragic this is, right? There are times that fathers can um, become so stirred up by their anger that, you know, they, they will kill a child. And you, and you realize something? Every father has the same pos pos potential to do so. If left to our just our most sinful human nature, we have the same capacity and yet to destroy, to hurt, And yet we can restrain ourselves. And more so by, by the restraining power of the Holy Spirit that we can swap that out with a choice, a conscious decision and choice to love instead. Now, Judah continues to explain in verse 32. He says, For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. And Joseph discovers that Judah had personally guaranteed Benjamin's safety and return. All right, he, he's taken on personal responsibility to ensure Benjamin returns to his father safely. And now, it, seems, it may seem obvious, right? The siblings ought to have that same care and concern, but... That's not the case today, right? Most times, people seem very detached from one another. We're very preoccupied with our own lives, preoccupied with our own devices, talking to our friends, but not to the ones who are seated at the same table with us. And, you know, realize this. The, this connection and this willingness to take up that responsibility for one another. Why? Because we are family. We are. And we're to love one another the same way. And here, you know, he's doing it not out of duty. This is not because this is in his job description. Because he loves his father. He cares for the well-being of his father. He knows this is important to his father. And, you know, a lot of times as children, we forget that it is not just what our fathers do for us. What about the other way around? What are we doing? Right? Are we, are we uh, thankful? Do we show that love, care, and appreciation? Yes, Mother's Day is very obvious. Left to our human nature, it's always going to be the biggest, biggest day, biggest celebration. Um, not Father's Day. All right? I'm not envious or, or, or anything like that. But, it ought to make us think a bit. Maybe we need to do more. Maybe there's more that we can do. All right? And here we see, right, Judah takes responsibility for his youngest brother. All right? In contrast, we see what? Cain disavowed any responsibility for his brother when God questioned him about Abel. Look at Genesis 4, verse 8 and 9. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Okay, let me translate this into modern English. Basically, when, when asked about his brother Abel, Cain told God this, How should I know? And why should I care? Realize this, right? Families can stop caring for one another. In particular, when individuals are going through pain and hurting, and more so when, you know, there is a death or loss in the family. Some families, I have seen firsthand, some families refuse to talk about what happened. All right? Because dad is gone. 
He's passed away. He's gone. And not, nobody is allowed, feels that they're allowed to openly talk about it. And so they're frozen in time. They, 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 it's like that whole family died. The clock has stopped ticking in that family. And the pain becomes so large, right? That li we forget life has to go on. And how we deal with this will affect the people around us. More so, you know, sometimes we refuse to allow others to comfort us. When God has given us one another, family, friends, whoever, to be a comfort. Now look at Genesis 37, verse 34 and 35. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, I will go down into the grave onto my son's mourning. Thus his father wept for him. What happened? You know, Jacob decided he was going to cling onto that grief and loss when he ought to surrender it to God. Okay, all the sons and daughters, right, they came to Jacob to comfort him, but he refused. He refused to be comforted. Okay, and we can become frozen in time if we're not careful, unable, paralyzed, unable to move forward. Now, our Heavenly Father knows what it's like, by the way, to suffer personal loss. All right, think about this, right? Go back to Romans 8, verse 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Notice, verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All right, who spared not his only begotten son, right? Jesus Christ. He delivered him up. He realized this. He willingly, all right, allowed this this loss and don't ever think that God doesn't understand as a heavenly father so we move on to a last point here right a heartfelt substitution Judah now makes a final desperate offer right to sacrifice himself for Benjamin's sake now look at verse 33 to 34 then now therefore I pray thee let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord. All right? And let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? He said, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. All right? He offers to be the substitute for Benjamin, right? To become a slave instead so that Benjamin could go free. All right? To sacrifice himself and his freedom for Benjamin. And for his father's sake, is it lest his father should go to an early grave? Now it says, all this was done for one thing, for his father. Why? Because he loves him. Even if his father cannot reciprocate. Okay, and the scriptures tells us what happens. Children, all right, to not, uh, when we're young, it says to obey our parents and then to honor our father and mother. Why? For it is right, it's still the right thing to do. Okay, this was a one-sided decision and choice that Judah decided he was going to undertake. We see the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. He did that for us. This is 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Okay, remember, Benjamin is the accused. Judah is innocent. All right? And what happens? He offers to be a substitute. Is it Christ did that for us? It says, for our sakes, he became poor that ye through his poverty might become, might be rich. All right? Judah took on Benjamin's guilt while he was innocent. Now, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, therefore he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, there is a parallel, all right? What Judah is doing, okay? And by the way, from is from the tribe of Judah that the Messiah will come. And we see there is a type of Christ here where what happens? The innocent 
now takes the place of the guilty. Okay? The innocent now takes the place of the guilty. Judah offers himself, all right, who knew no sin, what happens that he might be made the righteousness of God now, so that Benjamin will be acquitted of all charges, he'll be released, all right, uh, okay, not having to bear the consequences of, okay, this sin. We see sacrificial love is in the heart, both in the biological parent and also in the spiritual parent. All right, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7 and 8, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children, so being, notice, affectionately desirous of you. There was this affection and, and desire to want to meet, to fellowship, to come together. But uh, we were willing to have imparted unto you. This is not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. And Paul wrote about how his desire, right, is towards the Thessalonian believers, right, that uh, if he could, he would be willing to even sacrifice his soul for them, right, it didn't just impart the gospel. He says, if he could just do all that, right? Because they were dear to him. Second Corinthians 12 verse 14, said, behold, the third time I'm ready to come unto you, uh, come to you, and I will not be burdensome for you. He says, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And you see here, Paul talks about the sacrifice. Right, the willingness to sacrifice, the willingness to give, to give, to give from the perspective of a father. Right? Rather than to expect that it's going to be the other way around. Now, our Asian way is this. Oh, we have we like to have a lot of children. We like to have uh want them to be financially, you know, uh career-wise and financially, you know, successful. Why? Because then when we retire, you know, all I, the more children I have, the more money they can give to me. Notice here, no, it's the principle, the biblical principle is to lay, okay, is not to lay up for the parents, but it's for the parents to lay up for the children. Right? And he demonstrates this principle in terms of how he feels, how he ministers to the church in Corinth. It is, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Although what you're going to see here is even as a church, they were not so ready to return that appreciation. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And he points that out very, okay, candidly. Because a godly parent will provide, a godly father will provide for his own family. First Timothy 5 verse 8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, right? What does it mean? It says, it's worse than someone who has rejected the gospel and rejected the faith. Now, this is not just, oh, well, that's not very Christianly of you. You realize how serious that is? Okay? You denied the faith by your actions and by your choice. And this is your worst than an infidel because you know the truth, you accepted the truth, and then you turn your back on that. This is what? To provide for our own. Our, especially those in our own, under our own home. And again, our Asian way is what? We, we provide, sometimes fathers will provide more for their siblings and for their, you know, brothers and sisters than for their own children. How sad. Here it says, you know, Biblically, this is the priority. And a godly father will give good things to his children. Matthew 7 verse 9, 11, and, and whatever they request, right? Well, things that will be good for them. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? And Jesus said, if, then, if, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Alright? The sacrificial love, this giving our best, alright, to our children. Okay, what's good for them? Uh, we see this even in the heart of a pastor. Right, who cares for that church, 
for her with a sacrificial love. First Peter 5 verse 2, feed the flock, right? It means care, the pastor. That's what it means, right? Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight thereof, right? That's the office of a bishop to oversight. It says not by um, constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now, now this, um, here is of a willing heart, not for money. Okay. That, in other words, by implication, there is a willingness uh, to sacrifice those things for the sake right, of the flock. Right? Uh, not because it's a chore, because we have to. Okay? We're willing. We volunteered for this. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, right? Not to be abusive towards the sheep, but, say, but being examples to the flock. To love them. Right? To care for them. Right? The way a New Testament church functions, you know, we do things. Again, sacrificing ourselves, putting others corporately ahead of ourselves for one another. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 33 to 34. Wherefore, my brethren, notice, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. This is in the context of the Lord's Supper. But again, you see here, this is not just I'm coming here for to meet my individual needs. Say we tarry, we wait one for another. It says, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come together not unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. But you see here, they, they wait, they tarry, because why? Church is always about others. Right? About my brothers and sisters. Hebrews 10 verse 25 tells us, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more, Right? Even more so, it says, as you see the day approaching. Why? Because this is about when we come together, we assemble as a church, it's for my brothers and sisters, my church family. It's not about what I get out of it, it's about what I'm going to give. All right? Exhorting one another. Your being there, your, your presence is an encouragement to others, is a blessing to others. We come together for one another. Not because someone is nagging you to attend, not because someone um, okay, guilt trips you and then you know you feel guilty if you don't show up. Okay? And we it's not about us, it is about others. Even for the loss. Right? First Corinthians ten verse thirty two. Give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles, nor to, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, notice, notice, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Right? So that, for the sake of the loss, for, for the sake of soul. Now in closing, question, right? Do we hitch our fates together, right? Our outcome, you know, uh, whatever to one another as a family, right? As a marriage, as, as a church, or for that matter, as a nation. Right? National Day is coming up. Right? I mean, or is it just about, well, it's just me. I know self-preservation is a very, very powerful instinct. Okay? But it's more than just about us. Okay? And that's true if you're a father or you're a mother. Right? It's true if you're part of a family. See, and true love is not professed, but demonstrated by action. Okay? It's not just, it's not by our tongue or by words, but by what we do. And it's founded on truth. Okay? We love our Savior, we would also have a Christ-like sacrificial love for our brethren, for those who are saved, those who are in Christ. Do we show care in concern and consideration to whom we love. Right? Again, this is demonstrated by the actions. Right? Do we exercise our duty and responsibility to one another right, as friends, brethren, and family? Okay? You see, many times, it would seem more convenient to like not tie ourselves to one another. And yet, remember, a three, four, Threefold cord is not 
okay, quickly, not easily broken. Okay, the more we intertwine, that's a strength, it's not a liability. Right? How connected are we? Right? How, how involved are we with one another? Again, in our time of troubles, many times we, we kind of pull back. Right? Christ taught this by his life example, right? And by his death at Calvary for us. Now, as we close in prayer, we're going to have a time of invitation. Let me just encourage everyone, right? Maybe the Lord has spoken to you, dealt with you about certain issues and things, right? I want to just challenge you, right? Will you come in this time of prayer, right? Will you respond, all right? Let our hearts be tender. Will you respond to the Lord? Will you go to Him in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, even for uh, this time, even in the Word.